Uh, I'm Rich Howells, the founder and editor of NEPA Scene. I'm here with actor and author Brian Baumgarter of The Office fame. He has a new book called uh, The Night Before Christmas at Dunder Mifflin. So how did this idea for the book come about? Uh, the idea for the book came about, uh, really, we've been hearing over the last few years that families have been gathering together over the holidays and maybe not watching the old classic movies that I watched growing up, but getting together and binge watching uh, the Christmas episodes of The Office. And uh, one, I just think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and two, this book is meant as a gift, uh, really a gift for the fans at the holidays. Uh, over the last few years, we hear over and over again that The Office brings comfort to people, that The Office helps bring families together. Uh, it's a way for them, in some ways, to communicate. Um, a, a a share, a, some, some shared piece of entertainment that they can both enjoy. And so this is meant to be a holiday keepsake uh, for them to have. I'm, I'm really proud with how uh, the book turned out, how it looks, uh, the illustrations in it. I'm, uh, I had nothing to do with. I'm not, I'm not a drawer at all, uh, but I, I believe it. It just looks beautiful, and I'm really proud of it. Now, I'm sure the title kind of gives this away, but uh, is this like a recreation of the classic poem? It is a reimagining, yes, of the classic The Night Before Christmas poem, but set right here in Scranton, Pennsylvania at Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. So we take uh, moments stolen from the Christmas episodes of The Office and also just iconic moments uh, from all of the characters there at Dunder Mifflin and have created a new story, sort of a, a new canon, a part of the canon, of, if you will, of The Office. Uh, so it's not, it's not an episode uh, of the show, it's, it's something totally new and different. Hmm. So this book is narrated by Kevin. This, I, Brian is doing the audio, has did the voice for the audio book. So if you <laughs> buy the book and you want to hear me read it to you, that, <laughs> okay. is, that is also a possibility. But the, the story, in a way, is, is it, it, well, it's not in a way, it is third person, but um, let's just say, without giving the story away, it, there is a particular perspective of Kevin that, that uh, is in the story. Now, uh, all these years later, later, is it easy to uh, slip back into the character of Kevin? If you're what thinking do you mean? about it. <laughs> Uh, so I mean, look, I was, I was with him, uh, to, we were together, how about that, uh, for 10 years, yeah, it's not, it's not difficult for, for him to come out. <laughs> uh, so one thing that I found interesting is that even though The Office wasn't necessarily made for kids, a lot of young kids who are many years away from ever working in an office or even understanding some of the jokes are really into the show. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I, look, this is a new discovery for us. And when I, when I say the show was not meant for young people, it, it was not a part of our consciousness. We, it was very, very clearly we were creating a show that people who worked in offices could relate to. Like that's literally what we talked about. We felt like that was our audience. And I think my discovery with the resurgence that's happened, with so many young people who have gotten into it. I think originally I thought the, uh, let's call it the subversive nature of the comedy might sure. appeal to a younger audience. And I do think that's true, but I think also the parallel between a, an unreasonable boss who makes his employees do unreasonable things while stuck in a room with people they don't choose to be with, uh, parallels very clearly with an unreasonable teacher Hmm. who makes their students do unreasonable things okay. in a room uh, that they don't necessarily choose to be in. And I, so I think that that environment, uh, the fact that, that everyone is trapped in a certain space, which is really a part of um, the architecture of the show, is so similar. And then, look, there are iconic characters that have existed for, uh, character types that have existed for hundreds of years, and uh, there's a relatability there for sure. Is uh, uh, what do you think keeps the office relevant all these years later to people? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that's probably a question that other people can answer uh, better than I do. I do think that the fact that it is a documentary, right, which means that it is about a certain group of people that exist in a certain time, means that in a way it can't age, mm -hmm. because. You, you can't say, you can't call it dated.
because it is about these people that existed at this time. Right. You don't watch something that took place, you know, in the mid 1900s and say that's dated. It's like no, that's that's when it took place. And so I I do think there's a part of it that's that you start to not judge the fact that they're not on their iPhones all or that we're not on our iPhones all the time or the. Um, it also wasn't incredibly fashion forward, but even still, you don't judge the clothes or the hairstyles quite as much, I think, because of that documentary feel. So you've written uh, an oral history of The Office, mm -hmm. uh, cookbooks, and now a Christmas book. Is there any other kind of books that you're looking to tackle at some point? I, I, I'm not sure. I think this, uh, I, I'm, I'm really proud of this one now. I think, again, this is, uh, more than anything that I've done before, this was about fun. This was about giving a gift and for people to share and enjoy and, and have a, a big laugh and, and remember the good feelings that the office gave them. Uh, last question. Uh, you've been to Scranton uh, quite a few times. Do you have a, a particular favorite memory here or a, a certain visit or something that kind of stuck with you? Wow. I mean, there have been so many. Um, I think the, the moment that I, I remember most, at least today, we're back here at the University of Scranton and the, the very first office convention that we had here um, was in, there's no question, the first time us showing up here, they put on a amazing event and the fact that the fans came and we felt uh, in their presence the passion uh, of the fans how much it meant to people. It was really the first time that we had felt that, and that's something I'll never forget. Awesome, well, uh, thank you so much. All right. And uh, happy to see the, the, the book out and uh, grab a copy. Thank you, thanks so much, thank I appreciate it. to our Q&A today. My name is Michael Ritterbeck. I serve as the director for the Center for Student Engagement here at the university. And it is my pleasure to, um, to MC today's Q&A with our very special guest. So to, this afternoon, we are thrilled to welcome back Brian Baumgartner, the man behind Kevin Malone from NBC's The Office. Of course, being famous from The Office, um, Brian is also well known for um, many of his books, including Welcome to Dunner Mifflin, um, the Seriously Good Chili Cookbook, which he was here previously for, and is also his podcast, Off the Beat. But today we're going to be talking about the launch of his new book, The Night Before Christmas at Dunder Mifflin. So without further ado, please give a big round of applause for Brian Baumgartner. How are you? We're doing well, thank you. We want, I want to be the first to welcome you back to campus. Thank you. I got the opportunity to spend some time with you the last time you were here uh, with your chili cookbook. Yes. Which was really exciting, and I'm really excited to talk to you uh, today and submit many of the questions our audience submitted to you about your newest book, uh, The Night Before Christmas at Dunham Mifflin. But maybe what have you been up to a little bit since your last visit here a couple of years ago with us here at the University of Spring? Well, I was here last week. I don't know what you guys do. Uh, you I, I was in Scranton last week, uh, very briefly, um, in and out. Nice. That's what she said. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, no, but it's great to be back. We've been working on this book. I, uh, I've been in New York on, uh, you know, on a little uh, tour here. It's been a lot of fun meeting uh, a lot of fans. It, it feels a little early for Christmas, but... Uh, I guess that's uh, this is the timing for how these things work. Uh, it was so much fun putting this together. I, um, I I I don't know. You guys are old for this, but there's a Netflix show called Trash Truck that I worked on um, with a guy by the name of Glenn Keane. Glenn Keane won an Oscar uh, for um, a, a movie he did with Kobe Bryant called Dear Basketball. Glenn Keane also uh, is the animator that did uh, The Genie and Aladdin, uh, The Little Mermaid, um, all of the, the uh, 
the Beast and Beauty and the Beast, so all those Disney, um, iconic Disney characters sort of from that era. Uh, he and I worked together, and when we had the idea of uh, this book and to make it animated, it was like the first call that I made. I was like, I, I, I want you a part of this. And he uh, had an illustrator that he works with that did the book, and I, I just love how it looks. I can't wait to talk to you about that. So let's talk, let's go right into the book. So tell us a little bit about what inspired you to um, bring The Office into a classic holiday story. Have you guys ever seen the show The Office? <laughs> so this is what we started hearing. Have you guys, um, what we were told over the last few years is that people are binge watching The Office Christmas episodes over Christmas with their family. This is, I used to watch Elf or The Christmas Story and all of those things, but we started hearing like this became something that, you know, families of whatever age could uh, watch together. Um, and so this is really uh, a gift for people to have during the holiday season, like the night before Christmas that, um, that I read as a kid sort of a new telling of that with the office characters, with jokes and references uh, to the show that are sort of built into a brand new story. It's not like it's an animated or a, an illustrated version of a Christmas episode. It's a, it's a new story that incorporates uh, jokes, to be honest, of uh, 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 different characters did throughout the show. Yeah, so in, in Paging Through It, there's a lot of references to a lot of famous scenes, both from Christmas episodes and the general lore of The Office as well. So what was it like going to try to figure out what would be part of this story? Well, I, you know, look, I, I didn't really intend to do this. I know you guys can't see it. I don't know if you've seen it yet. But, you know, one of the things that was really important to me, I feel like what plays uh, a role in the show, uh, partly the way that it was filmed, but partly the way that it looks and 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 feels when you're watching it is, I call it the, the architecture of the space, right? So like that, the camera is moving with the character and that idea of like walking into the office and you see originally Pam's desk and you see what we call like Jim and Dwight's clump and you see Pam's painting on the wall and Michael's office and the conference room and all of that stuff. Um, and so early on, I thought they were doing, uh, he was doing some great uh, illustrations, sort of takes on the character, but I said, I need you to go and, 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 and focus on the space. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah. And so, like, I don't know, you're not going to really be able to see it, but just to sort of give you an idea of something that was really important to me, it's just this is the very first image from the book. So you see, you sort of feel yourself entering the space, uh, entering into you know, our office in the world of Dunder Mifflin, you see Pam kind of pass it out, a bunch of wine bottles around or whatever, but you see, you know, you see the painting, you see this is the blind for Michael's office, you see uh, Jim there in his chair with the jacket off, uh, sleeping there. So, you know, that was, that was something that was really important to me. I don't remember your question at all, but for some reason I started talking about the architecture of the space. That was perfectly okay. on point with the question, okay. how, uh, bringing the office into that holiday vibe. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of picking up the format, obviously you chose the night before Christmas yes. as the overstep. But what was that, the writing process? There was a lot of, I'm sure, rhyming you had to work on. Yeah. And illustration process, the whole publishing thing. Tell us the, tell us the story. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. I haven't done a children's book, and this isn't really a children's book, but the, the idea of putting... Uh, the animation, I don't know, something if anybody's interested in publishing or writing or whatever, I never knew this before and I've written other books, but with the illustrations, having to do the illustrations, and again, what was really important to me was capturing the architecture of the space and then getting all of these notes back from the publisher about where the bend is, right? So like you create an image, but there's a, there's a, this, this, you lose a certain amount. And so like where that happens and what that means uh, for the perspective of either, you know, because we have uh, several that are a, a two page uh, illustration. Um, rhyming is hard. I don't know. You just kind of have to uh, do the best you can. That was, uh, once we had an idea for each character, right? And um, uh, maybe a gift that they might receive or, or something. Once we sort of had an idea, then the, the challenge becomes about uh, 
the the meter of the words and and trying to come up with some some clever rhyme that's awesome so one of our audience members wanted to know what was your favorite part about this whole process of writing the book doing the illustrations was just super um i forgot i'm not supposed to use bad words here super freaking cool um because because of what i was talking about before in a way trying to find what we we had weekly meetings so he would go through and you would see drawings and then you would see the color laid in and then they would start talking glenn and mayel who was doing the drawings about the intensity of color and how it bled and what it, that was just really really interesting to me and to have the illustrations really not just be and i think about it now in terms of like dr seuss or whatever like stuff that i've seen before where the illustrations are not just doing what the words say but are actually additive to the process so we sort of talked about the office and the the feeling of it uh, the show um and not just the architecture of the space but how how it was lit and what it looked like and how that affected how you felt about these people who were trapped in this office uh, day after day. Um, so yeah, working with the illustrators and, and having a weekly, like two, three hour session uh, as, as it progressed, that was my favorite part actually, not the words. Well, it sounds like a really cool process and I definitely feel like the illustrations have a very unique take on it and kind of contribute to the action of of the story itself. Yes. Um, and so you mentioned about like this is a lot of um, based on the holiday episodes that people can kind of watch around the holidays. Sometimes they binge just those. And yeah. so there's so many of those that we can mention. You know, Yankee Swap, Moroccan Christmas. Maybe which one of those when you were making those was memorable to film, or did you like really enjoy? I mean, I feel like that's a better question for all of you guys. Um, I mean, my answer is look. Uh, if you've watched any of the bloopers, I'm sure you've seen the one from Secret Santa where Kevin sits on Michael's lap. Um, you know, that, because of sort of what's happened since then, has become this sort of iconic Christmas moment. By the way, I was just doing press in New York and doing these morning shows and afternoon shows and all this stuff. I watched that clip on like every single one when I walked in. Um, but, you know, I think for me, a lot of, and I've talked about this before, I don't know if anyone who's here has been to anything that I've said before, but for me, um, there are episodes that I love that I think are, are great. Stress relief is like, you know, that's usually what I put as number one, but part of the reason is what was happening behind uh, the scenes of it. So, you know, if you watch the show, on Netflix streaming or Peacock or whatever, and you weren't watching it as it was airing, which based on most of your ages, I, I know that you weren't. Um, the Christmas, at, at that point, the office was, we were really strong, like we were almost canceled uh, a couple of times. And it's weird, because now you look on Peacock and there's like 207 episodes, and you're like, okay, well this is cool, this went on for a long time, but at that time, it really, um, it, it, it really struggled, and what I've been saying is that the, the, the Christmas episode, the Christmas party, Christmas party, the Yankee Swap episode, uh, the first Christmas uh, episode of the show, it didn't launch the show, meaning it wasn't the first episode that we did, but that episode truly launched the success of the show. Um, that episode got our largest audience since we had premiered, um, and this was, you know, halfway through the second season and really from that episode forward it just continued to build momentum more viewers every week um, Steve won the Golden Globe uh, for Michael Scott month or whatever after the episode aired and so um, we I think back very fondly to those times but you know as you guys know if you've watched the Christmas episodes they're like a mess like everybody's usually drunk and in like every scene so like uh, what i used to say about that that uh the christmas party episode is like every single person has like a significant uh featured moment in that show and then i'm and then i, <laughs> I say like except kind of meredith except the last moment 
when Michael takes the pictures of her topless is like one of my favorite moments in like the history of the show. Like I just, it's like awesome. So like everyone is, is doing something and what that means is it's really hard to film. Like we're all, you know, a lot of people are in the background of a lot of scenes, that's one thing. But when you, the camera is having to find, you know, 12 people in the span of like a two minute scene, that means everybody has to be at least somewhat lit in a certain way and all of their performances have to be on point and the timing of all that stuff. So it's just really complicated. So like those episodes, that one specifically, was about an 80 hour week and five days. We were doing like 14, 16 hours a day uh, for that episode. So it was really hard. That's what she said again. And uh, to, to do, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, ultimately, I think uh, it, it makes it more rewarding. Thank you. So um, the next question was, you've already mentioned, like, a favorite scene or episode of Stand Out. That was fun to film. I'm sure several of those examples. Yeah. Several questions came in. Again, I'm sure you're not surprised about yeah. the famous chili scene. Yeah. And there was questions from people in this room who wanted you to reenact it in front of all of us. And I said no. <laughs> no chance. But I guess hypothetically, could you ever see Although the carpet is again? about the same. The carpet is about the same of uh, what we had. Do you think you would ever do it again for like in front of a live audience or for something like that? Yeah, maybe? Oh, for the ch spilling the chili? Yeah. You know, I mean, here's the, I've had a lot of people ask, by the way. Um, but I don't know if you've ever had Bush's beans. The best beans, the best chili beans, Bush's beans. I do work for Bush's beans, that was the joke. Um, this is what I always say, and, and I think this is true about, about, about everything. Um, any, if I were to try to do that again, it is only going to be a cheap imitation of the original. And so for me, it will never, it will never work this way. It will always feel somewhat less than. So I don't mind nodding to it, but I don't know. The idea of actually doing it again is, I don't know, probably not something I'm gonna do. Well, now those of you in the room who asked that question, you have your answer now. Uh, so there was a question. But I'll watch you spill it. <laughs> oh, he'll do it. Does anybody have question? some? Let's go. I'd be fired if we did that. Yeah. Uh, so there were a few questions about. I will say this: if there are people who haven't heard me talk about this before, because I mentioned the carpet, um, like a vivid memory that I have is um, we had set decorators, right? Like the prop guys. The prop guys had made the chili. I'll share a little tidbit with you. You can go back and watch later. But they came to me before we filmed that scene, and again, the carpet was like this. The carpet was the same for all ten things, and we never changed the carpet. Well, Todd Packer may have had them, had them change the carpet <laughs> in Michael's office, but the carpet was never changed. So they came to me, like really serious before we filmed, and we'd obviously done a ton of rehearsal because it was going to be a mess. And um, the carpet that I spill it on is an overlay carpet of the carpet, right? Because there's no way you're getting that out. And so the carpet went from in case there was an accidental spill or something, went from what I was just referencing the, the, before, the front door all around Pam's desk, all around the Jim and Dwight clump, like all in that front area. Um, and so it was massive, probably close to the size of like, you know, I mean, cut up or whatever, like this intersection, and they came and they were like, we, we have three of them, that's it. Like, so don't screw this up or we're not, we're not gonna get it done. So yeah, they like had, you know, their amazing uh, uh, craftsmen and artisans. They like relayed that carpet over the other carpet, so you you wouldn't know it was there. And I've heard you tell us story before. You said you did it in one. I did it in one take. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was a round of applause. Did yeah. yeah. So a few folks in the room have been hearing buzz about this office reboot spinoff. Uh, sequel, uh, and wanted to know what your take on it was. Well, there's a couple of things. Yes, there is a new show coming from Greg Daniels. Um, they're saying it is, uh, and, and I've talked to Greg about it and was just with uh, Ben Silverman in New York, co-author of the book, who's, who's involved in the new show, in the universe of 
Um, it is. Uh, what can I say? It is in the universe. It is in the world of. But we are not. Uh, we are. They are not returning to Dunder Mifflin at this time. And, and part of it is people talk. I think people don't know what the the word means. I don't mean you. I mean like the media, the press. There's talk of like a reboot or a spinoff or a, you know. There's all these words, and I don't really know what that means, right? Like because if it's if it's a, a reboot, right? If we're going back, I always ask people like seriously, what are you going back to? Kevin was fired, and now works at a bar. Michael and Holly live in Colorado. Stanley retired to Florida. Jim and Pam are in Austin. Like, what? What are we like? What, how do you go back in and continue the story, unless you're just taking, uh, you know, just a, a few of those characters, which I don't think is what people intend when they say that. You know, I, without any information, or um, do I think that the characters will? find a reason to reunite at a certain point in time? I think so, but, I, well, but I, you know, <laughs> but, but we'll see. I mean, I, you know, there's nothing, I just think there's a, there, there's an appetite for it, and I think that there is a, a willingness, um, a general willingness that if Greg wanted to do something else to continue the story in some way, um, we would be getting, but there's no immediate plans for that. Well, we look forward to follow along on that. Uh, the audience submitted a bunch of questions wanting to get to know uh, you personally and also no. and also you. your uh, your take on the Kevin character as well. So I've got a few questions to share with you. Okay. Um, uh, a couple of folks talked about Kevin's life after The Office. You, okay. just, you just mentioned that Kevin's uh, character, or Kevin in the show, owns a bar. I just heard recently on uh, Office Ladies, Angela Kinsey suggested that you should open a bar in Scranton called Malone's. What's your thoughts on that? We've discussed it over the years. <laughs> We've discussed it over the years. I, I actually looked at, uh, I don't know who's in here right now. We yeah, oh, there he is. Uh, I actually looked at uh, some, uh, what do you call them, blueprints for a, a space in Scranton quite a while ago. Um, it's it's all very complicated. It, it's becoming less complicated now as, as time passed, but um, you know, just boring legal stuff. Like, even though many people call me Kevin Malone, I don't really own the name Malone. It's owned by NBC, and what does that mean? And am I opening a bar with NBC? I don't really want to do that. And so it, it, some of that stuff just gets uh, complicated. In terms of Kevin, I hope to God he's still in that bar. Do you, have you guys, do you, do you know the story about that? Which is in part, uh, um, uh, inspired by my trips to Scranton. Do you guys know about the real behind the scenes story of Kevin and the bar? I think you, you should tell the story. Time? So it's weird. The The season finale of the show ended up being like almost two hours long. Uh, like for real. Because Greg, the joke was Greg didn't want to say goodbye to the show so he just kept writing and writing and writing and it could have been a mini series in and of itself, the last episode. And part of that story was Kevin opening this bar. So we had, I had gone in the summer before, as the writers always had us do, gone in to pitch, like specifically before the last, because we knew, we, we planned, like this was the last season. And they were like, how do we want this to end for Kevin? And we just started talking. And, and part of what I talked about was, um, and I don't know what it what it is exactly, but there well, there was something about Kevin that every time uh, in life, and particularly here in Scranton, um, people have an intense desire to buy me drinks, and I enjoy drinks as much as the next person. Um, sure. And so Greg concocted this idea, right? So the last episode, if you remember, takes place after the documentary has aired. And so the idea for, and, and the last episode takes place after the documentary has aired, Dwight fires Kevin, and then the next time, or before, then now the next time you see Kevin, he owns his bar. There was a whole story that was fleshed out that did not make, uh, I don't even know if it's on Peacock now, the whole story, but the story is this. 
The story is that the fans love Kevin, right? So in the fic the fictional documentary gets played finally after 10 years. And the, uh, the audience of the world who has watched this documentary become in love with Kevin Malone. And every time Kevin Malone goes into the one bar that he goes into in Scranton, Pennsylvania, they buy him a drink. And he can't drink as much as how as what he is being purchased for. So Kevin ends up with such a credit at this bar that he leverages that credit to buy the bar. That is how Kevin buys the bar in, in, in the show. That was the story. And we have, I have them at home still. They were sort of uh, accentuating this like, everybody loves Kevin in this story. I have all of these t-shirts with like weird animated drawings of my face and my head, which is like, we love Kevin. And apparently these t-shirts were a big hit to the audience of the people who watch this documentary. Um, and I know part of this weird like Reddit thread that claims that Kevin is a secret genius and has been embezzling money from Dunder Mifflin all of these years. And that's how he got the bar. That's this whole story. But I can say definitively that is not the story because this story was written and did not fully air uh, in, in, in the show. So there you go. There's a little, there's a little added. Some of this is deleted scenes. I highly recommend you go back and watch them. Uh, so a couple questions about you. Oh, it is? There, they are? Some of it, I've, I've seen okay. some of it, and I know, I don't know if we made it that far in the super right. fan episodes yet, but I wasn't surprised to make okay. it back in. Uh, so one, somebody here wanted to know what a surprising fact about you that a fan might not know, something about yourself. I don't know. Do you know that I golf? Uh, I golf? Um, I don't know. Apparently people buy me drinks. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, it's hard to know without knowing. I, um, I, golf is, that. I, that is what I love to do. That, you know, people ask like what my, uh, my enjoyment outside of work um, is, is definitely golf. Have you golfed anywhere in Scranton? I haven't. I've been invited a number of times it's always either the wrong time of year or I'm not here for a long enough time. So I have not, but uh, one of these days. We have a lot of golf aficionados. My mom is one of them in the room. So we'll, we'll, okay. get, we'll get you connected on one of your next visits. All right, all right. Uh, so um, somebody wanted to know, maybe out of, outside of the office, something you're really well known for, what's another achievement that you're particularly proud of, whether it's being an actor, you know, or you know, a producer, a podcaster, or something. like what's something else that you're really proud of that you've done? You know, I will say that um, if you if you haven't listened to it, uh, many people actually from Scranton here. I came here uh, to talk to folks. I would say one of my most proud accomplishments uh, was the original podcast that, I, and I love doing the podcast that I'm doing now. But the original podcast that we did, an oral history of the office, um, which was basically our attempt to answer the question of why The Office has continued to be popular when most shows get put out to pasture and die on some streaming service or whatever, um, where we really went back and, and I did 120 hours of uh, interviews with, you know, Carell and Krasinski and Jenna Fisher, but also writers and directors and network executives and hairstylists and, and really looked at what what was created on the show that that made it uh, potentially endure and become more popular after it was done. Um, I, I'm tremendously, uh, that was probably the most for, I don't know, I think it's uh, 10 hours uh, on Spotify. Um, but the, you know, it was a year in the making and, and the amount of work that we put into that uh, to, to create that show, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Well, I can absolutely attest to that. You might not remember, that's when you and I first met. Oh, that's right. I came, I came, you came to campus and interviewed Featured a bunch of people. a star. <laughs> um, uh, number of students and folks you mentioned in there, it's really great. By round of applause, he's already listened to this show. 
Uh, we have some homework here, but it's excellent office content if you're looking for it. It's a great story, and really it's very contained, very well done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, a lot of people wanted to know about your continuing relationships with the cast, and so I know earlier this year we saw a bunch of you come together for an at t commercial. That was really fun. Yeah, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we have done... Uh, Angela and I have done some stuff together. Uh, I just um, kind of, she has a Christmas movie that I went up to Vancouver and filmed uh, some with her and those kind of things have happened in televisions and, and movies or in uh, branded entertainment. But yeah, AT&T uh, came and there were six of us, which was definitely the most, um, the the highest number of casts that had sort of reassembled together. And we shot, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of spots that are, are still out there. Um, I think three or four days um, in Los Angeles all got back together again. And I mean, no, I'm not joking, like that. Everybody was sort of back. And we weren't playing the characters. I don't know if you guys, have you guys seen the AT&T spots, the rain pillow, sleep with rain? Um, uh, we just had so much fun and we were playing, as far as NBC is concerned, versions of ourselves and, and not the characters at all, but um, just having worked together and been together and understanding each other's, uh, not, not the characters, but our sort of uh, personal comedic uh, sensibilities and, um, and strengths, being able to banter again uh, was, that was really awesome. That was that was really that was really fun. It looked like a lot of fun. And we're still like we're constantly in contact um, from fantasy football. We're now uh, I think in our nineteenth year. Uh, John and uh, Rain and myself and Andy Buckley who played uh, 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 David Wallace and we've got directors and writers and some crew members still. We've all been doing it, and so yeah, we're just shit talking uh, texts. Uh, about fantasy football, so it's important stuff. It, um, obviously, there's been some, some news recently, but also just um, it, we still have have fun and communicate that that way as well. That was literally my next question. They wanted to know how you were in contact with them, so yeah. we're getting on the same page. There you go. Uh, any other reunions in the works, maybe that you know of, or maybe can't talk about, or nothing specifically at the moment. No, I'm sure there'll be a long. There's yeah. definitely a demand for it. All right, somebody in the room wanted to know um, about, from your time on the set, did you take anything from the set? Did you have any souvenirs or keepsakes? I know you mentioned some t-shirts. Yeah. Anything else you oh took from the set? Yeah, that doesn't even count. Um, I, I, took, I took a few things. Um, there are three, uh, three specifically meaningful things uh, that are on or around my desk uh, still. One is, the very first time that Kevin was referenced in the history of the show was the very first episode, and Michael Scott, you know, Ryan, the new, in, they, they used Ryan, the intern, to like introduce everybody in the show, and Kevin, or uh, Michael says some version of, you know, that's Kevin, he's not a great accountant, but is a great, a hell of an entertainer, or something like that, and they just have a shot over, and I have a giant pencil and I'm looking over at Oscar using this like giant fat pencil, like trying to make him laugh, like super lame. It was never referenced again, but it sat on my desk. I took that. Um, the other one that I took, I didn't intend, this was years later. I mean, just a couple of years ago, I realized that it was the, the greatest joke that the writers never figured out on the show. So for all that time, you may have seen it, um, I sat in the corner my back facing the wall and the wall on the side and I had a nameplate like some <coughs> dude in an office and the nameplate said Kevin Malone so as I left I was like well I mean I guess that's my name I should take the nameplate some significance and it was a few years ago I realized the greatest joke that the writers never figured out was that for for nine seasons ten years probably longer right Kevin didn't just get hired Kevin sat in the corner with his nameplate facing him. <laughs> and the idea of a nameplate is that it faces people who come in and can see your name as you're there. And the fact that it sat there, and I never realized it as I sat there that the name faced him. 
I found that funny. And then um, I, I took the, the jar of M&Ms. Uh, you had to. All right, so we are starting to run a little short on time. We had a lot of questions today, okay. so I've got a bit of a rapid fire. Oh, rapid fire. Rapid fire! So, again, some of these, these questions were submitted. No! <laughs> uh, so there's not that many of them, and then I have one last question after, just to kind of wrap okay. it up. Okay, rapid fire. All right, first question, audience submitted. Favorite Thanksgiving dish? Green bean casserole. Good choice. Uh, favorite Christmas movie? The Office Christmas episodes. <laughs> favorite Halloween movie? Uh, favorite Halloween movie? Does that mean scary movie? I don't know. The Shining? Okay. Um, favorite Why'd you say it like that? <laughs> <laughs> can't judge my rapid fire answers. No judgment, no judgment at all. What was I supposed to say? Favorite celebrity collaboration? Uh, my favorite? Celebrity collaborations? You see how I'm saying that's waste time? Favorite collaboration? I don't, what do you mean? Like, memorable one. One someone memorable. that I've worked with? Why am I keep talking? <laughs> I'm all nervous. Favorite collaboration? Someone else answer. What's your favorite collaboration? Steve Carell. There we go. Pickles, love them or hate them? Love them. Uh, dill, not sweet. Okay. Um, writing or podcasting? Podcasting. Chili or barbecue? Barbecue, I'm sorry. Uh, acting or producing? Uh, acting, probably. It's close. Tie. Tie. All right. Um, somebody asked if you had a piece of advice that Kevin, the character, would give to a college student. Work hard. <laughs> <laughs> Math, not important. <laughs> I added any advice that Brian would give to a college student. Uh, work hard. <laughs> Man, no. Um, I, uh, someone told me this a long time ago, and I know I'm not speaking specifically to theater students, so it's, uh, but this is what applies. Don't, um, don't focus yourself too quickly or too early. That sounds like a joke, but I, but I mean it. Like, I think, uh, uh, I, like here, went to a liberal arts education. I didn't go to an actor training program, and I think that the more diversity of experience and knowledge you have ultimately will serve you later on. That's, I do believe that. That was good advice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a question that somebody submitted I thought was a cool one. Um, if you and Kevin- Are we still rapid fire? No, we're done with rapid fire. Oh, okay. Thank you for participating. I can relax. If you and Kevin had the chance to sit down for a drink, what do you think you two would talk about? Oh my word. Uh, oh, wow. I guess I would thank him um, for the many, many things that he's given to me, but uh, more specifically, and I'll use this as an opportunity to tell this story that um, those who have been with me have, have heard a few times. This is a thousand percent true story. You got me like in the field bones there for like a weird second, but gotcha. I, uh, we used to do this press tour in New York, right? And so it's a big Manhattan building, so you go in and you have the security and you have to go in the lobby of the building and check in and scan yourself through the thing. And I walked in, a couple of us uh, together, and there was one woman who was standing there um, at the security desk, back to me or whatever. And I come walking up and we're like checking in and she turns around and she looks at me and she starts crying. And, and like basically instantly, not ball crying, but like tears. And um, she has a sweatshirt on and it says poor Richard's pup. And she tells about a time that she was going through a really difficult time in her life and that uh, some people had gotten together and I had sent her a message. Um, and she said she still has it on her phone and it, it means so much to her and uh, the sh how much the show means for her and uh, she wanted to give me a hug. And so I gave her a hug. And I still, at some point in all of this, believed that she was the person from upstairs who had come down to the lobby to get us to take us upstairs. And she had worn this poor Richard's 
um, sweatshirt because she knew clearly that I was coming. Um, that was not the case. She was just someone who was there in the lobby waiting. And those um, experiences with people that, um, it's not about me, but that the show means so much to them um, and has, has done something for them at potentially a difficult time in their lives um, is incredibly um, moving to me. And that's, uh, that's a great gift that I've had. So I, I think we talked about that. Well, thank you for sharing that story with us. And thank you for sharing all of your stories with us tonight. We love when you come to Scranton. And let's give Brian a big round of applause. Thank you, Brian. Brian's your brother is out there on the side. The big story is telling them on our behalf. Um, and so we're going to um, excuse Brian for a few minutes, and then we're going to get the book signing started in just a little bit. But let's give our guest one more oh, round of applause. Thank you all for coming.